Hello everyone, welcome to the first video of Math 115. So what we'll do in this video is study hyperbolic functions. So I'll give you the rigorous mathematical definitions, and then in class I'll show you how they arise in physics and science in general. Okay, so just to get started, one way you can understand hyperbolic function is very easy. All you're doing is adding h's at the end of trig functions. So we'll define instead of having sine and cosine, we'll have sinj and cosh. And then we'll have tanj and cotanj and sex. That sounds weird. And cosecant. Okay, that's pretty cool, but I need to tell you what these are actually precisely. So that's what we'll do now in this video. Okay, but let me just start with a little fact uh, which is true in mathematics in general. So start with any function f that is defined over an interval which is centered at the origin. So that means a function which is defined over an interval which oops, looks the same on both sides of the origin, something like that. So let me start with, say, function like this line and then a horizontal line. Now the statement is that for any such function it can always be written uniquely as a sum of an even function, so that's a function which looks the same on both sides of the y-axis, and an odd function, which is a function which looks the same but has opposite sign both sides of the odd, uh, the y-axis. And that can be true, that is always true, that can be done for any function f. So in this particular case here my function would be split into the sum of an even function something that would look like this, and an odd function, which would in this case be just a straight line. Now if you add these two things, then you will get exactly the original function here. Okay, that's pretty cool, but the important point here is that can be done for any function f. So how can we do that? Well, we just use the following trick. So start with an arbitrary function f of x. You can always rewrite it as follows, so as f of x plus f of minus x over 2, plus f of x minus f of minus x over 2. Of course you can always do that because the right hand side is just f of x. Right? The first term plus the third term gives me f of x and the second term cancels with the fourth term. But what's key here is that once you do that you can realize that this will always be even regardless of what the function f is and this will always be odd. It's actually a nice exercise to prove that. But for arbitrary f, this will always be true. So you have here a decomposition, a unique decomposition of f as a sum of an even and an odd function. Okay, this is all very nice, but why should I care about that? And what does it have to do with hyperbolic function? Well, let's see. So let's take one of our favorite functions, namely the exponential function, and let's do this decomposition. So I'll start with e to the x. According to the decomposition here, I'll get the even part, which will be given by e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2, plus the odd part, which is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. Now it turns out that this decomposition here of the exponential function is extremely useful, and in fact is so useful that it's been given its own aim. And the even part here is exactly what we call the hyperbolic cosine function, or cosh, of x, and the odd part here is what we call hyperbolic sine function, or sinh, of x. This is how these things are defined as being the even and the odd part of the exponential function. But let's now see what they look like in terms of graph. Okay, so here's the graph of the hyperbolic sine function and the graph of the hyperbolic cosine function. So I'll explain to you how you get the graph of the sine function, hyperbolic sine, and then you can do similar things for the other one. So this is really the sum of two terms, so let's just look at the first term. First term is exponential of x over 2, so its graph would be something like that. While the second term is minus exponential of minus x over 2, whose graph would be something like this. Minus e to the minus x over 2. Now if I add these two graphs, I indeed get the graph of the hyperbolic sine function. Now this is the graph of the hyperbolic cosine function, and you can see that if you add the two, you will end up with the graph of the exponential function as expected. Okay, so this is nice. Now we can define, uh, just as for trig functions, we can define hyperbolic tan and hyperbolic cotan and so on. So here they are. Hyperbolic tan is just hyperbolic sine over hyperbolic cosine. This is the expression in terms of exponentials that you get just from plugging the definition of hyperbolic sine and cosine. And this is the graph here, which has two horizontal asymptotes. Hyperbolic cotan is defined uh, similarly, hyperbolic cosine over hyperbolic sine. This is the expression and the graph with the two horizontal asymptotes and the vertical asymptotes at x equal to 0. 
And we can also define hyperbolic secant and hyperbolic cosecant. Here they are with their graph. That's what they look like. It's all cool, We're all happy. But let me ask you a question. Why do I use uh, things that look like trig functions when I'm talking about hyperbolic functions? Why do I use sec, sec cosecant, sine, cosine, and so on, while I define hyperbolic functions in terms of exponentials, which don't seem to have anything to do with trig functions? Well, it turns out that uh, hyperbolic functions, and this is what I'll show in the next video, satisfy a whole bunch of really cool identities that look very similar to trig identities. And in fact, it's not uh, by chance, because it turns out that trig functions and hyperbolic functions are very closely connected. So what I'll do in the next video is prove a whole bunch of these identities, and we'll see that they look very similar to the trig identities.